So I'm happy to be back here uh, again after last year's uh, transform. So I'll be broadly talking about this idea of gender expression, uh, which has come up in different ways over the last day and a half. But um, in beginning with the context of the Yogyakarta principles, but moving on uh, to relate it to our discussions and to the local context. Uh, Mm, so as some of you may be aware, um, uh, we have the set of international uh, principles called the Yogyakarta principles. We have a set of international principles called the Yogyakarta Yogy 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 principles, which uh, came up in, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, broadly, uh, they are in, in, in terms of placing them, they are not legal standards, but they basically restate existing human rights framework uh, when applied to questions of um, sexual orientation, gender identity, and now, more recently, uh, issues of gender expression as well. Now, the reason why these Yogyakarta principles are important is because uh, they set certain kind of norms uh, which courts at the domestic level as well as uh, international tribunals, international commission, uh, commissions and rights bodies are taken seriously and used in their uh, judgments and decisions etc. And um, also because it kind of serves as, like, as a bridge between human rights uh, law as well as kind of some of the discussions that we have here in terms of evolving ideas and understandings of gender, sexuality etc. So, that's where I would really place it as, uh, as being quite important. Now, in the Indian context, it's interesting because in the Nara's Foundation decision, the judges explicitly cite the Yogyakarta principles and use it uh, you know, when they decriminalize the sexuality. And in the Kershaw decision, which overturned it, uh, they, they completely rejected it. They refused to look at them, saying it's soft law. It's not really hard international law, it's soft law. We have not look at it. And they also refused to look at too many comparative um, you know, law, etc. And there's a whole other discussion that has happened on this. Uh, now, just to, to give you the background, in 2017, a group of international experts, including Arvind, who's sitting here with us, uh, so you can ask him if you have any nuanced questions about these principles. I quickly uh, gave him that one, but uh, they came together and they uh, came up with something called the YP plus 10. You, you get the principles plus 10, uh, where they um, changed certain things. So they added nine new principles to the original 29 and 104 state obligations and additional recommendations. Now, one of the most important things that they do, and this is where I just use the slides. Uh, so I, I, I use this. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, this is what they have done in the YP plus this 2017 uh, version. Uh, so you can see that they introduced this expression, gender expression, and here you can see that the way that they define gender expression. So the big difference, I can see when I go to the other slides, is that gender expression and sex characteristics does not figure in the first version. These are being introduced specifically. Now, so this is something that has evolved, um, and you can see how they have defined it, where they uh, talk about expression of um, a person's gender through physical appearance, including dress, hair, attire, etc. Um, and what they make clear is that even in the earlier version, gender, uh, gender expression is not only a standalone, it's not only a standalone term, but it also falls under, it's also a subset of gender identity. So the earlier version, we are used to the term soji, right, sexual orientation, gender identity, but now there's some kind of expansion. It's gender identity, expression, and sex characteristics. Now this term sex characteristics, I'm not even, sorry, the term, um, uh, so here you can see the uh, earlier version, which is how they define gender identity, right, so this is what was used in NAS and so on, and this is what we are, this, this is what that, that's often quoted in terms of how one's internal uh, experience doesn't match their external appearance, etc. Uh, so there's a movement, as you can see, between this and the previous thing. 
Um, so just let us just take a let's just to introduce what what has happened. Now the term sex characteristics, which I have not put on the slide, is defined as each person's physical features relating to sex, including genitalia and other sexual and reproductive anatomy, chromosomes, hormones, and secondary physical features emerging from puberty. And in the material that I've read about the term sex characteristics, it seems to be a term that is used in place of intersex. So instead of intersex, they use this term, sex characteristics. I haven't done much work on this, I don't know too much about that issue. I'm just going to focus on this term, gender expression, for the purposes of this presentation. Okay. Um, now, in the Indian context, as a person who was not really involved with the framing of this thing, now I'm taking this term, I was just thinking for the purposes of today, I was just thinking when I was asked to do this presentation, I was thinking about, okay, now we have this term gender expression and it's framed in this particular way. How would I actually read it uh, in the Indian context and how would this be useful to our discussions around gender and sexuality and what do I really think about this? So that's what I'm trying to do here. So in the Indian context, uh, one of the things that struck me immediately was the 1871 Act, which is the criminal trial, Registration of Criminal Tribes and Women's Act, which has come up in the discussions. Uh, a law which was uh, repealed, but you have various state versions, including the Telangana and the Karnataka and so on, which was challenged. And we know that this law outlawed both cross-dressing as well as dancing in public. So clearly, uh, there is a clear targeting of gender expression, although it's not framed that way, uh, right from the French right colonial period in terms of how the law is framed, this is recognized in that form, uh, in, in criminalized in that form. And one of the earliest cases that we have recorded is a case called Queen Empress vs. Khairati, which happens in 1884, where Khairati is a person in the legal records uh, described as habitually wearing women's clothes. And in a, in a surveillance shooting that the police were doing, they find Kairati singing dressed as a woman among the women of a certain family, which is when they uh, book her under 377, book Kairati under 377, and uh, subject Kairati to a medical examination. And, and they apply it. Um, so there is a certain way in which uh, gender expression, um, so I'm trying to is it significant, right? Even in terms of the way the law has been applied so far. Um, and in, in understanding what constitutes uh, what constitutes law that is not uh, behavior which is not acceptable. Now if you look at the term expression itself, I want to unpack the term expression itself. Just etymologically, the term expression comes from the Latin word expressionem which relates to vividness, uh, kind of a projection, uh, representation, a pressing out. Right? So there is uh, this idea that you're projecting something, you're projecting something outward, to the, out, to the external world. And uh, in Indian freedom of speech and expression law, we know, for instance, art, that you're familiar with, Article 19 1A is framed not just as a freedom of speech, but as the freedom of speech and expression, right? So it's, it's there. Now, this part and expression is not really being explored too much. What does this term expression mean? This was the, uh, this is just going back to what I just said in terms of the etymology. Uh, expression has been held, uh, for instance, in different cases, we know right to freedom of expression includes the freedom to vote or not vote. That's just to exercise your nota. Uh, to, to fly the national flag, to sing, rather not to sing the national anthem, uh, it, has been, it has been recognized as. And in Nalsa, we know that it's been recognized as a freedom to express one's gender identity. And in Nalsa, goes, is, is, is the judgment to actually kind of explore this idea of uh, expression more thoroughly. And this is how they explain it, right? So they say that. Um, it, in the, the right to freedom of speech and expression includes one's right to expression of self-identified gender 
and through its express dress, words, action, behavior, or any other form. Um, now, just going back, yeah, here again in Nalsa, you find uh, the state cannot prohibit, restrict, or interfere with the transgender's expression of such personality, personality which reflects that they had. So, this link between personality and expression. And just going back to the Nas case itself, because there again, uh, this there was an argument made that 377 violates 191A, and in that context, the judges rely on the South African Constitution for judgment, the NCGAD judgment, where they quote this paragraph, which was uh, used a lot. You know, you heard this paragraph a lot that a person cannot leave his or her sense of gender or sexual orientation at home. And this idea that we carry with us, uh, you carry with you your sense of gender or sexual orientation. And in interpreting the equality provision, when they interpret sex to mean sexual orientation, this is how they do it. They do it, the rationale they use is they say that mm, the purpose underlying this fundamental right against sex discrimination is to prevent behavior that treats people differently for reasons of not being in conformity with generalizations concerning normal or natural gender roles. And they go on to talk about stereotypical judgments and generalizations about the conduct of either sex. And I think that's interesting because in a way I think they are they are they are using this logic of it's a of stereotypical uh, non-normative uh, gender expression. Right? Non-normative gender expression, they don't define it like that. The language they're using is different. But I think that's where they're kind of coming from. Uh, if we go to the Tiruchi Selva bill, the version that was passed to the Rajya Sabha bill is changed. Again, you'll see that the Tiruchi Selva bill uh, has a clause which defines discrimination and in the clause, they talk about expression. Right? So it's there. In, uh, in, in the debate, when Tirichi Sabha himself is uh, speaking in the Rajya Sabha, and all this is available online, you can get the, uh, uh, the actual speech, again talks about diverse gender expressions and freedom of expression. It's foregrounded in a, in a, in a, in a, quite, a, in a quite an interesting way. Of course, when, when, we, move to, uh, when we move to the actual uh, uh, Lok Sabha bill that's now pending the government version of the bill, discrimination itself, the definition goes out of the window, so then you, you don't find expression there at all. No? It's completely missing, it's not there. Uh, because they don't define it, that, that term is not defined. And in Kutu Swami, the right to privacy judgment, again, uh, you, can, you find this idea that privacy enables people to take crucial decisions which find expression in human personality. And this idea that uh, there is a you, there is an intrinsic recognition of heterogeneity and the right of the individual to be different. Mm. Over here, you can they also talk about uh, dress, the, the fact that people should be allowed to eat, to dress, uh, to have autonomy. Such. So they use all these terms. But again, I feel that this idea of uh, uh, Non-conforming gender gender identities is is, is is kind of it's there. One can one it's there, but it's not put in the same way. Now, I think from 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 all the discussions of the last one and a half days, it, I think from for me, uh, gender expression is particularly important. It's a term that allows one to go beyond gender identity. Uh, it could include uh, gender non-conforming uh, people, people who are gender non-conforming, concerns of people who are gender non-conforming who may not want to fit into a particular gender identity or, or fit or say I identify as A, B, C or D. So there is that aspect of it. When it comes to youth, adolescents, in all the cases that we have heard so far about, uh, you know, people who, who, in the, who faced issues of harassment, discrimination in schools and young people at a stage where they may not have, may not identify right, in A or as A or B, but they don't want to cut them. They don't want, they might want to wear, 
they may not want to wear a skirt or a, or a pant. So, in those kind of cases, this idea that uh, I mean, this I think this this idea of gender expression could be an important way. Uh, I don't know in what form, but it could be a way of thinking through some kind of uh, legal and uh, policy. It could have implications. Uh, you'll see that in the, in the in the Ministry of Social Justice report. Uh, clearly talks about in the chapter which it talks about youth, it talks about gender non conforming and transgender children. There's a question that came up, a discussion around that in the last session. In 2015, a survey done by the Department of Social Justice in Kerala showed that 58% of transgender students drop out, and the reasons included gender related negative experiences. I mean, we talked about all of this, but there are no I mean, statistics, official statistics, to show how important this is. Um, in this, it's all the material, and I, I don't have much time, so I'll just quickly run through this. Uh, in the study done by Chenika, Shalini, and others, No Outlaws in the Gender Galaxy, you get a sense of this also when they interview people that puberty is a phase where most families <coughs> impose these norms, and that the family and the school become sites, right, of where gender transgressive persons actually bear the brunt of punishment. And uh, clothes, the length and cut of hair, body language become very important means through which people try to express and communicate gender to the outside world. Well, and I want to just go back to what uh, Lucy said is that this idea of, gen of gender, gender uh, identity, right, is so um, predicated on what other people think. It's not, it's a relational form. It is what other people are actually fixing on a person. So, if it's a relational form, then how do we then think of this idea of, of gender expression? Because there's an innate right for me to express it, but it's dependent. What I'm saying is, you cannot misread me, you cannot misread me. So, if that is the case, then how do we understand this in terms of uh, in terms of this in terms of how we go forward. Uh, there are some US studies again which talk about uh, adolescents. And this one I thought interesting. The first one which showed that um, in fact straight identified boys who are non conforming in appearance were being rated less acceptable than gay individuals who conform to gender norms. So that was something that came out of the study and I thought that was quite interesting in the 12th and 10th grades. Um, yeah, so this idea that gender expression is linked to co-construction by others and that it, it has to be lived in tandem with continuous reading and attribution by others. And this, just to end, uh, I found this quite useful, this book, Julia Serrano, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's the first time I, that's why I read it for this presentation. And one of the things that Serrano identifies is a uh, a transgender woman based in the US, transsexual woman, talks about uh, the idea that being a woman as opposed to being feminine, the, the, the idea that being a woman is becoming more acceptable in our social and legal norms, but being feminine is still a, a problem comparatively. So she kind of plays on that, and now just to end, one other thing she that comes out strongly to the book is uh, do we need to move from breaking gender bin binaries that's a form that we often pose our question in to actually challenging all forms of gender entitlement so I end there, thank you